um, aware of that. All right, and my name is Martin Hedberg. I'm a meteorologist and I'm part of the research desk team. So is Toya Westberg, who is uh, doing the technical stuff behind the scenes. And uh, yeah, welcome very much, Landwein. And um, you may introduce yourself. And did I forget anything, Toya? I need to check that first. No, okay. So Landwein, welcome. Yeah. Hi, thank you so much for inviting me to this session. Uh, my name is Lan Wang Allison, and I'm a researcher at Stockholm Resilience Center at Stockholm University. And uh, I'm researching on the regional water cycle. And uh, in this recent study, we applied the water cycle research also on um, the rainforest, not only Amazon, but also Congo and uh, the Australasian rainforest. So I will start by trying to share my slides. And I also like to say that um, I'm not uh, usually lecturing for public or even students. So um, please feel very free <laughs> to um, interrupt and ask the clarifications. I will try to my best to be as clear uh, as possible and use as literal technical terms as possible. Uh, but yeah, please interrupt uh, me if there's anything unclear. Does this slide work? Great. So let's see. So to start with, uh, I would like to introduce to what we mean by the water cycle. So this is, uh, of well, course- Actually, uh, yes. just a short point. We also see your um, next animation. So you have oh. your, um, and your, um, so how does it comments? Yeah, I think you need to share the full screen and not the notes. Yeah. yeah. Because you, you share the PowerPoint presentation um, as, a, as a program. So if you share, I think it is like choice number one. If you share your screen view and then have the. Is that working better? Yes. That looks better. Yes. Great. <laughs> um, yeah. So first of all, um, let's go through the water cycle. I think it's probably uh, basic to many, but um, as you know, the water comes from uh, evaporation, vapor flows from the ocean that rises to become clouds, travels with the wind and falls down again as rainfall, as precipitation uh, over land. But once over land, it can evaporate again. Um, thanks to um, um, a large part to vegetation, to forests that are there transpiring and using the water for the photosynthesis, uh, but also to, because there is water available for evaporation from soil, from grass and uh, from just from the ground as well. Uh, and this evaporation travels further and becomes rainfall again. And this part, that is evaporated, transported, and forced down as rainfall over land uh, is particularly interesting, I find, because it means that what you do on land, what kind of land use, what kind of, uh, if you have forest or if you have grassland, actually affect uh, the rainfall further downwind. So here we see uh, the proportion of um, the, let's see if we can start this, oops, does it start if I press this? Yes, so this is a video showing the proportion of the rainfall that uh, also comes from evaporation from land. So you can see that this is in, in spring, in March, uh, there's a lot of uh, rainfall in, uh, notably in the Northern Hemisphere that has its, uh, a high proportion of the rainfall coming from evaporation or, or from land and not primarily from ocean. So this can be rather high, uh, up to 90%, even 100 in certain days uh, in, uh, in the boreal areas. And also you see how the winds are bringing the in South America from uh, north downwards uh, to the south uh, east parts. Uh, and also in Africa, you have a more east to west movement um, where there's a lot of moisture uh, from land to the Sahel region, for example. 
And if you accumulate this uh, over the year, you get this picture. So you can see that in Northern China, in Eurasia, high percentage of the rainfall over the year, then of like something like 80, 90% of the rainfall could come from evacuation from other land areas. And in South America, uh, in the reddish part, you can see that up to 60, 70% of the rainfall comes from other land areas. And in Africa, you have this West African region uh, that, and also a Western part of Congo that has a very high percentage of the rainfall coming from other land areas. You could also turn this around and look at where um, this land evaporation come from that also falls as precipitation of land. So this is the opposite picture. You could show, see that in the red, uh, there's a high percentage of the evaporation that goes to uh, other land areas as rainfall. So you can see that these are major uh, sources of rainfall. Um, in mean, like large parts of Europe, uh, over 67% of the evacuation also falls down as rainfall elsewhere on land. And you can see that Amazon, large parts of the Amazon and also Congo are, and also Eastern Africa is contributing a large part of the evacuation to rainfall elsewhere. If you focus on, um, this is another video I tried to, this is uh, showing the monthly so this is the same as the global, but this is just showing the um, rainfall that comes from the Amazon forest. So you can see that if you, even if you just isolate the percentage of rainfall that comes from Amazon forest, not from land overall, there's still a high percentage, notably in uh, south, um, <clears throat> in the southwestern part of Amazon forest that receives a lot of its rainfall from the Amazon itself. Um, and for Congo, you see the same, uh, that it, due to the wind patterns, uh, you have in the Western part of Congo, a high percentage of its rainfall coming from the Con Congo rainforest, uh, which is bounded by these lines. So there's a big difference, what kind of vegetation you have for how much evacuation you can have because the vegetation is not only using the water, so it has roots to tap into groundwater, to tap into soil moisture, it stores the moisture in the soil and then use it for photosynthesis, for biomass production. So uh, there's a lot, of, lot more vapor going into the atmosphere just because you have more vegetation. If you compare a densely uh, forested area with say a desert uh, land, um, there's much less evacuation from desert land because of this. So if, here's an example where we apply the model to simulate what would happen if you remove all current vegetation in the grid cells here in Mato Grosso in South America. And you can see that in blue, this is the rainfall that you uh, have with current vegetation. And in red, this is the precipitation you would have uh, if there were only desert vegetation in the source region that we applied. So there's a huge difference in evaporation and then also then in subsequent uh, precipitation, depending on what kind of vegetation state you have. Um, let me but, stop here for you. No, if, yeah, there's any questions? Yeah, we have a question and, and that is, uh, from Eva Lindberg, was all these pictures showing the 2013 situation, or, or put it broadly, is, is this, this is, is it measured data or is it modeled in today's uh, climate situation versus something else? Um, so the atmospheric uh, data, the meteorological data uh, is all um, uh, reanalysis data, as can you say, so it's uh, oh, oh, observed uh, and modeled uh, assimilated uh, data. Uh, but for this particular scenario, of course, the desert vegetation is a model situation with permutations with assumptions. So, um, uh, and it's only accounting this particular example. Um, we only take into account the water balance. So of course you could expect uh, 
other kind of atmospheric interactions. You could change the wind. Uh, you could change the uh, convective processes, so how much clouds. Uh, so here we don't affect the cloud formation, we don't affect the circulation, we assume that all those things assume the same um, mm. in the two different situations, even though they could be different. So this is just a purely water balance. So what happens if you remove that moisture, then what is the, the, the water, uh, if the water is removed, what happens to the precipitation? Yeah. Uh, and the real analysis that was for a specific year, or is it the, an, an average over a couple of years? Um, maybe it's, uh, maybe I, I think, models, but... yeah, so <laughs> I'm actually not sure which years we use. Uh, I don't remember exactly, but normally we would take, uh, in our analysis, we would typically take at least a decade of data. Yeah. Um, so I would expect that we did this as well, but I, I can't, I have to recheck to be absolutely mm -hmm. sure. Thank you. That's okay. Uh, are there any any other questions or clar clarifications? You can raise your hand, and I mean, we're uh, it's, it's no problem. You can ask them yourself rather than me reading the, the chat. If you have anything on your mind, if not, I will move on, and then if you have other questions, yeah, yeah. yep. Well, please continue. All right, so. Um, so how does this uh, link up to forest resilience? Uh, so there's been early studies showing that rainforests are very dependent on how much rainfall it receives on an annual average. And here's showing uh, from this study that if you would just take a snapshot of today's rainforest cover and line it up with the rainfall that it received, it seems to be a threshold uh, somewhere between um, 1,500 and more than 2,000 millimeter per year of rainfall. Uh, rainforest does not seem to be able to be sustained. So we could not observe much rainforest below those kind of uh, rainfall levels. So using statistical methods, you could then calculate what is the probability uh, based on those observations uh, that you will have rainfall versus savanna. Uh, and that's why you see this kind of curve that the probability of having a, a rainfall uh, radically increases when you have a high rainfall and then the probability of having savanna, this orange uh, goes up if you are in the middle range, uh, just about 1000 millimeter, you have a very high probability of having savanna. And if you decrease uh, rainfall even more, you would go to uh, what they call tree-less states, so more like pure grasslands. Um, so this means that if you have received less rainfall, there is also a risk that the forest transitions into a state where there is less tree cover and those less able to provide moisture to the atmosphere to be less able to provide evaporation that sustains downwind rainfall. Uh, so from an early study, we looked at what happens if you have a chain of this, because it's not only once that the water cycle happens over the rainfall, it's, it's a cascade of this kind of water cycle. So you have a number of cascading recycling. So what happens if you would block the most inflow from ocean, for example, or if you have a deforestation situation where um, you lose the evacuation uh, and therefore have a decreased rainfall. And, and this continues to cascade all over the Amazon. And we saw that it could self amplify. So some part of the forest loss happened because first you have a, say, a climate driven uh, rainfall decrease, but also because there is forest loss that further decreases the rainfall. So that's what we call this self amplification that there's a certain part of the forest law that is purely due to this internal water cycle dynamics. And um, this maybe also feeds into, we could say that uh, a state of the forest or the state of a uh, patch of land, whether it's savanna or forest, uh, it does not, however, only depends on the current state of the environment, but also depends on what was there before. 
So say that you have a patch of land like South America and you start with a fully covered rainforest and you start to decrease the uh, rainfall, you will eventually come to a kind of a collapse when the precipitation falls down. And then you go to a savanna state or more uh, accurately like a degraded forest state if you go into this direction. And for the savanna state then to go to forest state, you have to increase precipitation again. But the level of precipitation required to move on to the forest state is actually higher than what was required for the collapse. So in scientific terms, this is called hysteresis, that there's a history dependence uh, of what state you have. It's not only because of the current snapshot of rainfall, but also what was there before. And part of this is because of this moisture feedback. So the ones you lose, if moisture, there are many other feedback mechanisms that keep this uh, that is playing into this hysteresis, but most of the cycling, so this water cycle is one part of it. So once you lose the water cycle, you have this self amplification effect, it's difficult for Savannah to go back to forest. So, um, I don't know, is there any questions or any questions for clarification so far before I go into the article that recently? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, I know that some of the participants are really familiar with these kind of graphs, but can mm -hmm. you? Can you describe them a little bit? What is the, you did it moving from one to three and et cetera, but sort of the notion, what's on the X axis and, and the hysteresis and the trap. And this is actually a metaphor where you sort of similarly to, to the right there, where you sort of imagine that there's a gravity pulling the ball in different areas. But can you elaborate a little bit around this way of describing nature and different stability? Domains. Right, right. Um, so if we look at the first figure, the x-axis shows the precipitation. So the more towards the right, the higher the precipitation. So in the forest state one, you have a high precipitation. And the y-axis, the vertical one, shows the tree cover. So that's why you also have the forest state up quite high, uh, because it shows that a forest state has a high tree cover. And then you go towards this tree left state or savanna state. It's a bit uh, maybe inaccurate, but we're just saying that it's a non forest state. Um, and so, what it's showing <laughs> uh, is that, um, so, so when we go along this S in this first graph, it simply means that we uh, imagine a change in precipitation. You could go decrease the precipitation, and that's where you go from one to two. Uh, and there is a tipping point at two, because below that line, the forest could no longer be sustained, and it collapses. So when you go the other way around, it's not necessarily possible for the savanna to, to, to go the same way back. Uh, so it needs more precipitation to recover. So that's what this S is showing. Uh, the second figure, you are turning around this um, S figure a bit. <laughs> so it's a metaphor, like you're saying, it, to show that this is a cup and ball diagram. So the cups show that this is a stable state. It means that when you're in the cup, um, maybe you shouldn't think of the gravity dragging it down, but more that it is a cap state and you don't have this kind of acceleration as, a, for example, when you go towards the lower part of the cap, um, you don't necessarily accelerate towards it in, in a real <clears throat> mechanistic cap and ball uh, situation. But it's a metaphor for showing that in this cap, um, it's difficult to move to an other state. And once you're in that state, uh, you are also stable. So the forest state, when it's, you have a deep cup, it's fairly stable. But when you decrease um, the water cycling, you have a lower resilience. So this cup for the forest state gets pushed up and the ball has an easier time to go over to a savanna state. So you say you have a disturbance like, for, uh, like fires uh, or a drought situation. When you have a lower resilience, when the cup is more shallow, it's more susceptible to 
fall over to a savanna state if the resilience is low. It's easier for it to fall victim to disturbances, you could say. Is, was that clear? Yeah, perfect, perfect. But it, it's it's very if you work with these maps and graphs every day, it's it's all natural. But just the notion that the first to the left, it's actually a line where sort of nature prefers to be on that line. But in the second graph, it's it's this metaphor of cups. It's so it's, it might be confusing if you're not familiar with them. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, right. Oh, and we have a question. Uh, let's take that. Uh, Eva has a question, and I see. You. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, yes, um, I was just, uh, I've heard that, and I understand from your, from your illustrations that forest that's uh, on the coastline, the forest closest to the sea is of huge importance to actually move precipitation into uh, huge land areas. Um, I think maybe your former picture sh show that and just if you, if you want to say something about that right so i think you this mean one, yes this one yes and this is also something we see in the uh other figure we saw from the more data driven i, I think we also see here so in the first uh, figure the presentation from land you can see that at the, the proportion of rainfall that receives uh, evaporation from land is primarily in the sort of southern part of Amazon and also in the La Plata Basin in South America. But when you look at the evaporation to land, uh, a high percentage of evaporation goes to other land areas. You have this really dark red along the coast in the north. So I think this is showing also what the other more conceptual figure is showing. Is that what you meant? Yes, and if uh, if de deforestation happens uh, uh, closer to the to the coastal area, then uh, it will also decrease the movement of uh, evaporations further in on on the land area. Right. So you could say that if you deforest along the coast, uh, it will have repercussions, cascading effects all the way um, down to the more down, downwind part. So in a catchment analogy, you would say this is a important source upwind region uh, for provisioning forest uh, moisture to more downwind areas. Thank you. I saw that me, you were waving with your hand as well. I just want to check that I've understood correctly. So if we cut down large amounts of rainforest, we'll decrease the amount of evaporation from the rainforest and decrease the amount of precipitation. And suddenly the rest of the rainforest can die even though we didn't cut it down. And then it'll be really difficult to get it back. Hmm. Right. Exactly. Um, so um, the, in this study, we quantify the child amplification to 13%. But uh, I mean, of course, it's a stylized uh, model. So it, I guess it requires more um, sort of sophisticated methods as well to determine exactly how much. But I, I guess that gives you a a sense of the magnitude of the self amplification effect. So it's not, I mean, 13% is a lot, but it's also not uh, the whole uh, uh, answer to why you have hysteresis. There's a lot of with fires and uh, biodiversity and many other biogeochemical um, reasons for, for that. All right, shall I move on? So we had this um, paper last week. It came out Monday in Nature Communications. Um, so here we wanted to analyze the hysteresis. So this, uh, this difference between when does it collapse and when does it recover? So how, what is the history dependence um, of tropical forest um, under climate change? 
and we applied a severe climate change scenario. So RCP 8.5, for those of you who are familiar with these scenarios. And um, we looked at three, we divided up the forest in three categories. You have the stable forest, the bistable forest, and the non-stable forest, you could call them. So the stable forest means that uh, it's deterministically forest because the rainfall is so high that it's quite certain to sustain forest. In the bistable state, the climate could sustain both savanna and forest, so either or. Uh, and in the brown part, um, it's not stable. Uh, it's not supposed to support stable forest. Um, so when we look at the, for the current uh, state, um, the current climate, you can see that in the green in Amazon, quite a large part of it is stable. And also for Indonesia, a lot of it is green. So a lot of it is stable. Whereas in Congo, almost none of it is stable. It doesn't mean that it's near tipping, but that it means that the climate supports both forest and savanna. It has a lower uh, rainfall amount in Congo. And under climate change, if you look at the end of the century, um, this stable forest part in Amazon radically decreases. So you have this green part almost exclusively along the Andes and part of the Northwest. And the, uh, along the coast, a lot of it becomes non-stable forest. So the, the part that uh, is upwind to sustain moisture is becoming, uh, it's very unlikely that it will um, remain. Well, we don't analyze the risk, so I shouldn't say unlikely, but it's uh, not stable. Uh, and then in the Congo, because of increase in rainfall, um, you have a larger part of the forest actually becoming stable, but although it's still small, uh, and then Indonesia, not much happens. It still continues to be stable. Uh, and you could also, so, so this is a translation of showing on the x-axis you have the rainfall percentage of, pers of present. So if you're 100, it means that you're at present rainfall. And on the y-axis vertical line, you have the forest extent at 100, that's the present. To, this is just to show how the uh, forest zone moves and also how the rainfall zone moves with recent climate in blue and end of century in red. So here it's also quite clear uh, how for South America, uh, large parts of the Amazon forest move with a decrease in rainfall also move towards a lesser forest extent. And for Africa, because of this increase in rainfall um, of more than 20%, uh, the tree cover also slightly increase. And then in the, the difference between the dashed and non-dashed is the most recycling effect. So it received quite a lot of media attention. I just wanted to touch upon it because there was also some misunderstanding in media. Um, lots of it was quite alarmistic, saying that Amazon is now on the brink of transitioning, uh, that something <laughs> that is a near tipping point of switching from rainforest and savanna. There are other studies or there are other uh, debates around how close are we just at the tipping point for Amazon. Uh, but this study is not particularly showing that something has happened right now. It's um, more showing that at the moment, when, when they say 40%, it means that 40% of the rainforest is bistable. Like we saw in Congo, uh, most of the Congo rainforest was bistable, but it doesn't mean that it's at the brink of transition to savanna. It just means that it uh, could support savanna just as likely as forest. If you would deforest all of Congo, uh, and you will have a very hard time of regrowing to forest. That's what it means. So you have this hysteresis effect. Whereas in Amazon, if you would deforest everything, 40% uh, of it will have a very difficult time of growing back because um, so what we see is in fact a hysteresis effect 
that it's already forest there, and therefore we have the forest. But if we remove it, it will have a hard time growing. Um, so some clarification uh, I wanted to just add because it's receiving so much media attention and also some confusion and some despair, uh, that we did apply a very severe climate change scenario. We didn't apply, say, some of a more moderate climate change scenario. And uh, we also analyzed the dry season intensity. So all those graphs that we produce are based on mean annual rainfall. And based on dry season intensity, you could see that all state forests were bistable. Um, so there's some uncertainty there. Uh, and also notably in the media, there were basically no attention of the Congo forest, which I thought uh, it's also interesting because Congo forest has received so little attention, but it, uh, we are studying to show that Congo forest is almost entirely bistable. And if we didn't have this severe climate change scenario, it also means that it is uh, highly susceptible to deforestation driven tipping. Uh, and also just a clarification, when we say savanna state, it's actually a technical term for this degraded forest. It doesn't mean that when it tips, it tips into a proper functioning savanna ecosystem. It's just a non-forest in the modeling world. So I, I think for a takeaway that I think is maybe more optimistic than the um, maybe untriggering <laughs> uh, media headlines is that uh, we do see that climate change is severely affecting the stability of Amazon forest. And so it's a risk, uh, a severe risk we need to take seriously, but it also means that this opportunity to get away, it doesn't mean that we are at there now, but it means that we, if we also prevent such severe climate change scenario, it also means that we are able to um, uh, steer in the direction of Amazon stability. So I hope that's slightly more optimistic <laughs> and uh, action, um, calling for more action rather than um, depression. <laughs> so thank you. If you have any questions, maybe. Thank you very much. Um, we had uh, 